right, so what Sean and Ariel are doing right now is they're shrinking the edges of this uh, floor pan. As you can see how the edges are a little bit warped, especially around here since this area is so thin, it likes to get warped up. Um, so as the metal's going like this, what you have to do to fix that, if you use a, a shrinking hammer and dolly, it works sort of, but it doesn't really shrink as well as a shrinker and stretcher does. So what, right now what they're doing is they're running this entire edge through the shrinking stretcher to add rigidity to this piece. This piece was super wavy before Sean and Ariel shrank it. Now you can see the same process that they got going on on the other side. Obviously, this piece is so big it needs two people. So we got this car out of Canada a couple years ago. It spent a good portion of its life on the track somewhere. So with that said, we have some aluminum fenders we've been hanging on to, these GTAM uh, wide body fenders. And so we had some nice Avon uh, race prep tires going on some 15 inch GTAM wheels. So it started to come together what we wanted to do with this. So we decided we're gonna turn this into the, the ultimate track car, if you will. We, uh, we're gonna make this thing as light as can be. We're gonna fully stitch weld every bit of it. And so it's gonna be a very rigid chassis. And there's a reason why, and we'll explain that in a minute. But as you look at this car, this is about as extreme bad as it gets. It rarely gets any worse than this. But what we said we're gonna do is, is we're gonna mix it up a little bit. We're going to create a build and you're gonna know what we're spending on it. So with that said, you know, when we lead up to the front, you can see that these are old race fenders and they've been around the track quite a few times. So if we fix them, we're gonna fix them again. They're gonna be absolutely perfect and everything's gonna just look fantastic. It's gonna be very period correct looking race car. So we've got a, a Nord two liter motor we've had for a long time. We've been wondering what we're gonna do with it. Um, uh, we're planning on installing that into this thing uh, with 155 twin plug heads. We're also flirting with the idea of installing seven millimeter uh, valve stems in here. So when it's all said and done, we're looking at 230 horsepower with 180 to 185 uh, foot pounds of torque, uh, pushing about 10,000 RPM. Much potential in a car, you have to give that horsepower somewhere to go. So you can't have the body in its original form, it would actually destroy itself. So we're gonna fully stitch weld the entire chassis of this car. Anything that's dead metal is gone. We're just gonna completely reinforce this. If it's too heavy, it's gone. If it doesn't have enough integrity for the new motor, it's gone. It's gonna have a full roll cage, eight point cage for certain. We're gonna do a lot of extreme things on this and the idea is, is to expose you to what it takes to convert any given Alpha into a race car. Oftentimes, it's a better candidate to start with a car that has a lot of problems than it is to cut up a really nice car. In this case, this car didn't have much of a future, so this is a perfect situation for it. Um, we've never made it a practice to build cars on spec, but that's exactly what this is gonna be. As this car gets closer and closer to the finish line, it's gonna be available to sell. But the idea is not so much to market it as it is just to show you what it takes to convert a normal Alpha into a race car, but more importantly, it's gonna show you what it costs to build something that's gonna be competitive and well-made. Um, this is kind of blasphemous in our business because ultimately you don't really want the, the entire world to know what it takes to build something as far as financially. Um, but in this case, we think it's just the right thing to do because there's a lot of ambitious drivers out there who want to race, but they don't really have a sense of what it's going to take to make a competitive race car. So we're going to show you. This is a project to start this summer, so stay tuned on that. It's not something we're going to start for, what, at least another 90 days or so. But when we do start on it, uh, you'll get a very strong sense of what it takes to make this happen.
here we're doing an update here on the tail of this car. As you can see, we've got all these resistance welds that Sean has integrated into the car, which makes it look factory. So not only do we want to restore this car uh, to factory specs, we want to make it better. But again, we want to make sure that it looks factory, like it's never ever been uh, in this type of construction mode. So as you can see, uh, Sean has resistance resistance welded uh, this tire tub in. He's got everything in place that he needs to do. He's mocked this up two dozen times at least, you know, with the trunk lid to make sure that the fitment is right. Um, so as you can see, we're, we're starting to tack this in. Uh, we're committed to this and uh, we're ready to go. some of these launches are going to be just as popular and highly sought after as an early alpha. Um, these Scorpions, you think about it, there's a lot of cool factors in these. They got rear engines, they, you know, the power to weight ratio isn't fantastic, but with a little bit of good tuning, you can make them something special. This car, in effect, is going to be just that. We're taking a normal Scorpion, we're going to turn it into a Lancia Monte Carlo. We're going to deal with a great deal of extensive mods too. This car has got a fantastic build plan. Johnny's going to explain to you some of the things that are going on, but in the meantime, if you're not familiar with what the Lancia Scorpion and or the Lancia Monte Carlo is, you really should look into them. They're really cool cars. You can get these pretty inexpensive. Setting them up don't cost a whole lot of money, um, but you can turn these into fantastic little performers. The market on these is kind of soft, so, you know, I have a feeling in the very near future, the popularity is going to go up substantially. John? Yeah, so what we're doing is extensive body modifications. If we want to come around the front here, I'll talk to you guys about what's going on. Now, our customer had this super, super cool um, radiator fabricated, especially for this car. It's an aluminum radiator, radiator with electric fans. Um, that's going to be mounted here in the front. and. Uh, the ducting that we're going to do is going to be super custom to get more air into the engine bay. Uh, so we're going to talk about that, how we're going to do this. Uh, if we want to come into here, we can see what we got going on in the... Uh, so we're going to mount uh, this tire here in the front somehow. They're usually mounted over the engine uh, in the rear of the car. Uh, so we're going to fabricate something to mount this so it's nice and tight, doesn't rattle around. Uh, we've got this new fuel cell that we're going to mount up. You can see here all, the, all of the notes that our customer has inscribed into uh, the car of what he wants to do. I mean, this stuff is everywhere. He wants a lot of modifications done to this car. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to integrate this double bubble top into this car so it looks nice and smooth and factory. The reason we're doing that is because um, this is something that our customer has asked us to do because he's so tall. He's a big, big dude, so he needs that extra headroom. What we're going to do, since we've got the fuel cell in the front there, this is the fuel filler cap. This is where it goes. So we're going to add some ducting to get more air into this engine bay, keep it cooler. Uh, we're going to do a lot of trick stuff back here if you want to come around and start showing you. Notice uh, the rattle canning that our customer has integrated into his firewall. Screw it. He doesn't want it. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to modify that firewall for him. What we're going to do is we're going to fabricate an access panel on this side of the engine bay. This parcel tray here, we're going to shave it. We're going to integrate something different, a uh, piece of metal that's right angled. Looks super custom. Um, we're doing that because we need extra space for this uh, supercharged engine that he's having being built, uh, especially for this car. Um, we've got some metal work that we're going to be doing here. We're going to insulate this uh, because it gets super hot. You can see how this, the paint has just been boiling off this car because the exhaust runs through here. So rear mounted engine, we got we to gotta make more space for this huge uh, engine that he's got going on here. 
Uh, obviously, he's got a lot of more inscriptions here going on that we need to do, uh, which means glass needs to come out, glass needs to come out. Um, he wants a roll cage to go through uh, this tray, the new parcel tray that we're going to fabricate and weld it onto his uh, subframe mounts down there. What we're also going to integrate into this build is strut tower braces. Um, that's going to be to compensate for this massive engine that he's got going on in here. Another thing that is pretty cool that we're going to do is where the taillights go. Um, we've got the license plate that goes here. We're going to shave all that off. Uh, it's made out of plastic now and we're going to fabricate this piece out of aluminum and we're going to louver the piece. We're going to relocate the license plate down to the valence bumper, the rear valence bumper for a cleaner look. It's going to really clean up this entire back end. If you want to follow me into the cab, you can see what we got going on here. Our customer is looking for a custom dash. He doesn't like the factory dash, so we're going to integrate a racing dash, a custom handmade racing dash, whether it's out of aluminum, stainless steel, we're not really sure yet. We're not really sure what it's going to look like, but he's got some really nice aftermarket gauges that we're going to integrate into this car. So hand, picture a hand-built um, dashboard coming down with a hand-built uh, center console that's going to cover up this. Uh, so what this is used for currently is the cooling and air ducting for the engine bay. Uh, there's no drive line that goes in there obviously because it's a rear mounted car or rear mounted engine excuse me. Uh, so this is going to be covered up with a handmade uh, center console that's going to be wrapped up uh, in fit really nicely up against this handmade dash. So we've got a custom Tilton brake clutch package uh, that we're going to be bolting into uh, the firewall there in the front. Now we talked a little bit about the fuel cell. What's going on is the factory uh, fuel tank is usually mounted in the back uh, next to the engine. What we're doing with this fuel cell is we're mounting it in the front on the opposing side of the driver uh, to distribute the weight of the car a little bit better because he is such a big dude, that's going to help him out big time. This is Ariel over here. He's responsible for this. So you guys saw what we started on the other corner. Now we had to do the same thing on this corner because the sheet metal on the valence bumper was just totally toasted. Um, now. The funny thing about this is the bumper mounts behind it. Uh, as you know, the, there's a thick plate back here that uh, mounts a bumper to the front valence. So not only was this matched in and fixed up with a bunch of Bondo by a body shop a long time ago, but this bumper mount back here wasn't ever straightened. So it was really buckled. Uh, when Ariel tried to smooth out and shrink up this metal, this metal with uh, a shrinking hammer and dolly, um, he still couldn't get an alignment for this hole. Uh, this hole was way up here uh, for the, on the bumper mount. So what he had to do is he had to take a torch and heat up that metal, take various tools, hammers, picks, dollies, to get that shape back in there where he wanted it to. Um, he had to do a little welding on that piece because it was torn up from the collision. Um, and now he's got that whole center. So when he mocks up the bumper before this is all tacked in and committed, he knows that this is going to fit really nicely. So at the moment here, I've got everything outlined to where I'm going to put my new filler door into. And right now I just scribed up a couple of marks that I'm lining up this straight edge with and I'm going to scribe myself a line across here. And what, the, what that's indicating to me is where this flange is. So that tells me how far back on this metal I need to uh, cut out to get everything to fit in. This guy's actually going to come in from the back side and we're going to uh, lay it up. So over here in this uh, rear quarter area, we actually had a lot of rot down here in the lower quarter area. Um, now on, on the inside of this quarter panel, there's also another splash guard that sits between the quarter panel and the, uh, the tire tub. And so while I had this piece off, I actually had to make the lower section of that, uh, of this 
uh, splash crap that's up in here. I don't know if you got a good shot of that at all. Oh, can't see uh. shit. All right. So on this uh, rear quarter section, we also flange this guy as well uh, to make this up underneath this all metal here. Now what that does for us is it just provides a smooth transition from one piece to the other. So that way there's no lapping of metals on top of metal. Uh, one problem we did run into was right back here where we needed to join the, the rear piece of this quarter panel and the tail panel. Uh, the pieces didn't quite made up uh, decent enough to make a flange at all on it. So on that one we actually did end up having to lap the metal over. And when I welded that up I got it real nice and hot and I just kind of smoothed that metal over to kind of uh, make that transition. On something a little bit more rounded like this, that's pretty easy to get away with. Then uh, we took the 9 inch grinder, come across all the welds along here, smoothed it all down, and then this is uh, all metal that we put across it. And what this does is it protects everything, creates a uh, waterproof barrier for any pinholes in the welds, and basically functions a lot the same as lead uh, back in the old days, but is a lot less toxic, it's a lot easier to work with, and a lot more sandable. So the style line is the most difficult thing to keep in shape all the way down. I mean, we're talking about going down the door, down the fender, coming back down around the headlight bucket. The contour of this line goes up like this and comes back down this way. It also wraps around like so. So welding right above the style line is actually a very, very difficult thing to do. You have to take your time. You have to use various tools. Again, we've talked about hammering and dollying while you're welding, while the weld is hot, because when the weld cools down, you see all this blue in here, that's the metal becoming hard. It becomes hard, you can't move it. So as soon as you're done welding, you have these two ready, and you're hammer and dollying all the way around, uh, because, or else the metal's gonna distort. You'll have problems with the metal tin canning on you, all kinds of stuff. So it's best to take your time and weld. Some people just try to weld, 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 weld because they don't want to take the time. They think they're going to save time by doing that. What they don't think about is later on you're going to have to fix the panel, fix the metal, fix the distortions with body filler. If anybody out there has done uh, body work, they know that body work takes a lot of time. It costs a lot of money. You have to sand down the filler, prime it, sand it, prime it again possibly. So if you take your time and actually do a good job of hammer welding, again by blow drying it with an airline, you're going to see that the metal turns out much, much better.